So what I'm going to do in this PowerPoint is a discussion and a review of the exercises associated with fallacies of relevance. This will be parallel to what I would typically do in the classroom when we would get together, but since we're now converting to a fully online format, this aspect of the class is going to be online as well. So I'm going to do a really quick discussion of a few elements of fallacies of relevance and go over a few spots that students typically have difficulties with. And then I'm going to go through the exercises. So this is not going to be a lecture. I've already done the lecture and you have that available. So I'm just going to hit a few of the, of the main topics that typically come up, go over the exercises, and then you'll have the opportunity to ask any questions you like by posting them in the questions forum, which I have just now made available in Cougar Courses. So here we go with fallacies of relevance. You should recall that fallacies in general are errors in reasoning, and we're focusing on informal fallacies. These are errors in reasoning that occur in inductive arguments. These are weak inductive arguments, and we're learning the various patterns that these weak inductive arguments can fall into. In this group, we have the fallacies of relevance, which all share the same basic feature, which is that they offer evidence for a conclusion which is, not which is not logically related to the conclusion, but it may appear to be psychological motivation to accept the conclusion. So therefore, you have no rational basis to go along with the argument, but often we do for various reasons. So let's take a look at uh, some of these fallacies uh, in, in kind of a general sense, and then I'll focus on a few trouble areas that I think um, you may need some further discussion about. So hopefully you recall that fallacies in general are errors in reasoning, where evidence is given that doesn't logically connect to the conclusion of the argument. Informal fallacies occur in inductive arguments where the argument is weak, and we group these weak inductive arguments into various uh, categories depending on the specific kind of error that they commit. In the fallacies of relevance, the specific kind of error that they commit is that they offer reasons or premises that are not logically connected to the conclusion. They don't provide any logical reason to accept the conclusion, but they provide psychological motivation to perhaps go along with the conclusion. And this is very different. So these arguments can work because of the psychological pressure they put on us, but they shouldn't work if we're thinking critically. So let's look at some of these uh, fallacies in this category, and I'll focus on uh, just a couple that I think are typical problem areas. So here's our list, and I'm sure that you know by now that some of these have subcategories and uh, variations. But I think that most of the fallacies in this group are pretty easy to understand. The appeal to pity and the appeal to force. We'll see some examples of this when we do the exercises. These fallacies are pretty easy to spot. So are the appeals to the people that we're going to experience and arguments against the person. Those are fairly easy to identify as well. However, one trouble area that seems to come up almost every semester has to do with the difference between straw man, red herring, and missing the point. And that's an area that I want to give special emphasis to in this particular discussion. Most of the other fallacies we'll, we'll see again at the toward the end of the slideshow when I'm going over the exercises, but straw man, red herring, and missing the point tend to be hard for students to distinguish initially. It just takes a few more examples and you should get the idea. So let's take a look at straw man, red herring, and missing the point, and I'm going to compare and contrast them. So in the slides that follow, I'm going to give some examples of straw man fallacy, red herring, and missing the point. And hopefully these will illustrate for you the distinction between these three fallacies. One thing that they tend to share is that there are two person fallacies where one person is committing the fallacy against another person. So I've set up some examples that hopefully can make that clear to you. So let's get started with straw man. Straw man fallacy involves creating a distortion, a distorted version of an argument, and then attacking that distorted version. 
since the distorted version is usually ridiculous and preposterous, it falls over real easy, just as a straw man would fall over real easy with just a tiny little push. This is a very common debate tactic, and you see this a lot in political debates especially. So here's an example of a straw man fallacy. In this example and in the subsequent example, person B is the one who is committing the fallacy. So here we have person A who has an opinion about taxes, and person A says, I think taxes are too high. So B, person B, instead of exploring the dimensions of that view, says, oh, so you don't want to pay any taxes at all. Is that it? Well, clearly this is an extreme, exaggerated version of what person A said. Person A didn't actually say that they don't want to pay any taxes. They said they want to pay fewer taxes. So person B has distorted A's position, made it ridiculous, and then is going to attack that ridiculous, distorted paraphrase. Okay, so this is the general strategy you see in the straw man fallacy. Let's take a look at another example. So here again, it's person B who's going to commit the straw man fallacy. Person A says, people should eat less meat to reduce stress on the environment. Person B then responds, well, it's crazy to expect everyone to convert to veganism. Well, maybe yes, maybe no, but the point is that person B has taken A's relatively reasonable claim and exaggerated it to an extreme version and then proceeds to attack the extreme version. Again, this is not what A said. It's a distortion of what A said, and it falls over real easy. So the key idea to keep in mind with a straw man is, are we actually hearing the actual argument? Are we attacking the actual argument, which would be the real man, or is the attack against a distorted, extreme, exaggerated, uh, dishonest paraphrase, in which case you're attacking the straw man and it falls over real easy. So with straw man, the relevant idea or concept to distinguish it is distortion. The person committing the fallacy distorts the original argument and then attacks the distortion. The key idea in red herring is slightly different. Here we don't have a distortion of the original position, but rather a distraction onto a new and different topic. So it's like a hunting dog following a trail can get distracted by a new scent, in this case the scent of red herring fish being dragged across the trail, and then they go off on a completely different tangent. So let's take a look at the example here below. Person B will be committing the red herring fallacy. A says, I think taxes are too high. Person B says, maybe Hey, speaking of taxes, did you know that in Uzbekistan, people don't pay any taxes? Well, that's very interesting, but it has nothing to do with what the original point was, which is that taxes are too high. So now we've gotten uh, ourselves distracted off onto a completely different topic, which is taxes in Uzbekistan. Now, this is a, an exaggerated kind of example to make the point, but you can see that person B is not distorting A's view. Person B is just going on to a completely different topic. And that's the key feature you see in red herring. Let's take a look at another example. So here again, it's person B who commits the red herring fallacy. A says, people should eat less meat to reduce stress on the environment. And B says, maybe. Hey, have you tried the new Impossible Whopper? It's amazing. So now we're talking about a completely different thing. It may be true that the Impossible Whopper is amazing. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but that's really not the point. We're not talking about that. We're talking about reducing stress on the environment and eating less meat. So you can see that B has taken it in a completely different direction. That's an example of a red herring fallacy. So straw man and red herring both commit fallacies of relevance but in different ways. A straw man introduces the irrelevant feature of a distortion of the original argument. Red herring commits the fallacy of, uh, of uh, relevance in that it introduces a completely different topic which is irrelevant to the original topic. So straw man, the key idea is distortion. Red herring, the key idea is distraction. In the broad sense, all of the fallacies of relevance miss the point. 
because they offer evidence that isn't logically related to the conclusion that is being drawn. The specific fallacy of missing the point does this in a specific kind of way, where a position is offered maybe by one person, maybe by one person to another person, and then a conclusion is drawn which doesn't follow from the information. A reasonable conclusion would perhaps follow from the information, but the conclusion that is drawn is often exaggerated, bizarre, and completely uh, unrelated to the information that's being given. So let's take a look at an example of missing the point. Again, person A uh, is going to make a, a claim. Person B will commit the fallacy. Person A again says, I think taxes are too high. Now this might reasonably lead us to draw the conclusion that maybe we should elect politicians that, that would advocate for lower taxes or reform the tax code or something like that. Those would be reasonable things that would follow from person A's claim. But person A draws the conclusion that, well, yeah, you shouldn't pay your taxes and then go to jail as a tax protester. Well, that, that kind of misses the point. The point is not to pay your taxes or not pay them and go to jail, but rather let's come up with a more reasonable solution to the situation. So person B has missed the point. And here again, we have person B missing the point once again. Person A says people should eat less meat to reduce stress on the environment. And person B says, yeah, I agree. We should make it illegal to be a carnivore. Well, that's not really A's point. A's point is that we should reduce meat consumption and this would lead to you know, less, less farming and less stress on the environment, less water use. He's not saying anything about making it illegal, but that's the, the conclusion that B draws, which is an extreme and kind of a bizarre conclusion. In some of the examples I give in the exercises, uh, you see similar kind of parallel cases where uh, for example, a student doesn't do well on a quiz and therefore says, well, I didn't do as well on this quiz as I had hoped, so I guess I should join the army. Well, that kind of misses the point in an extreme kind of way. You shouldn't join the army just because you missed a quiz. You should join the army if you want to join the army. But if you, if you did poorly on a quiz, maybe a more reasonable resolution would be to prepare more, to go to office hours if you can, to reread the textbook, to take good notes. Those are reasonable responses to that issue to join the army would miss the point the point is you need to improve your study habits so th these are three areas where i think students get stuck straw man red herring missing the point hopefully these additional exercises and discussions have given you a little bit more insight into these different fallacies now i'm going to move to going over the specific exercises that are found in the folder of additional fallacies of relevance exercises and I'll give more or less comment on, on all of them, and we'll see most of them are fairly straightforward, and I'll, and I'll highlight those that I think might be more problematic and perhaps a little bit more difficult to discern. Hopefully at this point, things are becoming clearer for you, and with a little bit more practice, I think you're going to be fine. So here we go. Let's move on now to the uh, exercises that are found in the folder. So these are the exercises that I had originally posted in the file folder under fallacies of relevance. And originally when I posted these, I did not include an answer key. And my, my reason for that is I wanted you to work through these. And then when you come to class, I would provide you an answer key because we would go over these examples. And by the end of the session, you should have answers to all of them that are correct. Uh, in the meantime, I have indeed posted uh, an answer key at the end of these exercises. So I changed the file a little bit. Um, and so I'm not going to go over the, I'm not going to read them out to you and go over them in, in general. I'm going to kind of just comment on the specific aspect of why the particular exercise manifests a particular fallacy of relevance. So here we have the first five. And number one is an appeal to pity. And the reason why it's an appeal to pity is that um, it may be sad that, that Frank has this difficult situation, but that's not a reason why he should be given the accounting job. That's not really relevant to whether he should get the accounting job. So here we have the appeal to pity, which uh, is focusing on something that isn't relevant to this particular case. In number two, we have a, another easy fallacy to spot. This is the fallacy of the appeal to force. Here again, uh, the idea is that you know if you don't join our organization, we're going to cause your business to suffer serious destruction. Obviously, that's a threat, and so 
that would be an example of a typical feature of an appeal to force. So pity and force, these are usually fairly simple to recognize. Fallacy number three, uh, I'll read a little bit. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, today the lines of battle have been drawn. When the din of clashing armor has finally died away, the Peace and Freedom Party will emerge victorious. So if you can imagine this taking place, what you have here is someone clearly trying to rile up a crowd, right? The phrase at the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, is indicative of someone talking to a group of people. And in print, often you see lots of exaggerated language and lots of exclamation marks. This is someone who's really trying to get somebody uh, very excited about their topic. So this would be an example of a direct appeal to the people. A direct appeal to the people has someone directly talking to a crowd of people. The indirect appeals, which we'll see in just a second, do something different. They focus on our relationship indirectly to other people. And you see that in number four. So number four says practically everyone downloads music free of charge from the internet these days. Therefore, you should have no qualms doing it yourself. This is an indirect appeal to the people. It's an example of a bandwagon fallacy. It's basically saying, well, everyone is doing it. You don't want to be left out. So jump on the bandwagon and join the group. And this is an indirect appeal to the people because it's appealing to our inner psychological relation to other people and our desire to want to be accepted. It's not directly trying to convince a crowd of people. It's really just directed at us and trying to convince us by appealing to our sense of wanting to belong to the crowd. Um, Number five does this in a slightly different way. Uh, Of course, you want to buy a pair of slinky fashion jeans. They really show off your figure, etc. This is another indirect appeal to the people, but this one is about vanity. So the appeal to vanity is different than the appeal to the bandwagon, where uh, with the appeal to vanity, some aspect of our physical appearance is what is important. Here, we we have these desires to want to look a certain way or be perceived a certain way. And the argument here is, well, then you need to wear these particular jeans. As you can see, uh, the appeal to vanity and also the appeal to snobbery are very common features of advertising. Uh, We have desires to be perceived in certain ways and advertisers have or try to market products that they believe will satisfy our desires to be perceived in the way we want. Okay, so here's the first five. Hopefully those are clear. Let's move on to the next group. In this group, we have a couple of examples of argument against the person, uh, which takes various different forms. In number six, we have the argument against the person abusive, where uh, a conclusion is, uh, is discounted based on the fact that the person making the argument has certain negative aspects to them. So basically, an argument against the person abusive insults the person making the argument. In this case, Professor Pearson's arguments against evolution are rejected because the person, Mr. Pearson, Professor Pearson, is claimed to be a cocaine snorting pervert, right, and a member of the Communist Party. So the argument against the person focuses on something that is irrelevant, which is the person making the argument, rather than what is relevant, which is do the person's premises support their conclusion? So that's an attack on the person abusive. In number seven, we have a variation on that, which is the ad hominem or argument against the person circumstantial. Now in the argument against the person circumstantial, we're not attacking the person's character per se, but rather their motives for making an argument, which are claimed in some maybe perhaps subtle way to undermine that person's argument. So here, The idea is that Dan Marino's uh, ad for Nutrisystem shouldn't be believed because he owns stock in the company. So therefore, what this is saying is that he's got a motivation perhaps not to be completely honest about the product. So here uh, we're attacking the person, but not by insulting them as in number six, but rather by undermining their, their motivations. Number eight is an example of something we were looking at in some detail before. This is an example of a straw man fallacy. So we have Larry Kudlow, and he's Trump's director of the National Economic Council, and he's making an argument that government should get off the back of the American businessman. And then 
the argument immediately pivots to, oh, so he wants to abolish government altogether. Well, no, that's an extreme distortion of Cudlow's position. And then the rest of the passage goes on to attack that distortion, which is easy to attack. It's easy to attack the view that we should abolish government altogether. But that's a straw man, and it falls over real simple, really easy. So this is an example of a straw man fallacy. Okay, now number nine is doing something different. Uh, the school board argues that our schools are in desperate need of repair, but the real reason our students are falling behind is that they spend too much time on their computers. So nine is not a straw man. It's not attacking or distorting the view that our schools need repair. It's taking us onto a completely different topic. That is, that the students spend too much time on their computers. So if you can see the contrast between number eight and number nine, eight is a straw man, nine is a red herring, then you clearly understand the distinction between those two fallacies. Okay, now number 10 takes us in a slightly different direction. It says something is seriously wrong with high school education these days. After 10 years of decline, SAT scores are still extremely low and high school graduates are practically incapable of reading and writing. The obvious conclusion is that we should close all the schools. Well, clearly this conclusion misses the point. If scores are going down and high school graduates are having difficulty reading and writing, then maybe we ought to work on early intervention. We ought to perhaps have smaller class sizes or more tutoring services or so, any one of those would be a more reasonable conclusion. The conclusion that we should close all the schools misses the point. So here we have a nice set of the three that I had emphasized earlier. And again, hopefully you can see the distinction between the three. The genetic fallacy tries to uh, either support a position or reject a position based on the origin of that position. So the, the fallacy here is that uh, where an idea comes from has some relevance for whether or not it's true or false, which is not the case. So here we have uh, the claim that you can safely dismiss that energy conservation plan because it's the brainchild of a liberal think tank in Washington. So here they're saying that, well, that's where the idea came from, therefore the idea is false. But clearly where the idea came from has no relevance to whether or not it's true or false. It's true or false based on whether there's any evidence for it. Now here we have a couple of examples that are reinforcing uh, things we've already looked at. So number 12 is an argument against the person circumstantial because it's trying to discredit Erica Evans' argument by saying that her motives for making the argument are her, her potential personal gain. So that's saying that her motives for making the argument are dishonest. And that really doesn't matter to whether or not the argument is a good one or not. Uh, 13 is an example of a bandwagon because it's it's saying you should see this movie because it's very popular. This is a pretty common tactic with film advertisement. They tell us how much money the movie's making, how many people are seeing it, and the implication they want us to draw is that it's a good movie and won't you feel silly if you're not if you don't see it and everyone else did. And so that's playing on our desires to be accepted by the crowd. 14 is uh, again another example of an argument against the person. It's saying Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy is useless because he was a certain kind of bad person. Uh, he may have been a bad person, he may not have been a bad person, it really doesn't matter uh, to the point of is his philosophy worth reading, is it worth the paper that it's printed on? That depends on what it says, not on who he was. So, so 14 is an argument against the person abusive, where we try to reject a view by insulting the person advocating a view. 15, let's see now what's going on with 15. Let's see if you can get this one. Senator Barrow advocates increased Social Security benefits for the poor. It is regrettable that the senator finds it necessary to advocate socialism. And then it goes on to attack socialism. Clearly, hopefully, you can see that this is our old friend, the straw man fallacy. Senator Barrow makes a point about social security benefits for the poor, and then the person attacks that view by saying, oh, he's advocating socialism. Well, that's an extreme distortion. And then they go on to attack that distortion, but that doesn't touch the original position at all. So 15 is a clear example of a straw man fallacy.
So 16 is an example of what we've seen earlier. It's a genetic fallacy. It's saying that the proposal for solving the welfare situation should be rejected because of its origin, that it comes from the Republican Party, which isn't really relevant to whether or not it's a good plan. So the genetic fallacy focuses on origins, which are not relevant. 17 introduces uh, a, another argument against the person, one that we haven't looked at yet. This is the two quoquet fallacy, where uh, what, we, what, what the person committing this fallacy tries to do is to undermine or reject a position by pointing out that the person making the argument or holding the position is being hypocritical. Um, it's like the, you know, rejecting an argument that smoking is bad for you made by a person who's smoking. Well, that person is a hypocrite, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily wrong. So here, what the uh, what this newspaper is trying to say is that, well, you know, they accuse us of being polluters, but that company's a way bigger polluter than we are, which might be true, but that isn't relevant to the issue of whether you're a polluter or not. So it's, a, it's an attempt to, uh, attack the position advocated by pointing out that the person making it is a hypocrite, or in this case, the institution making it is being hypocritical. 18 should be fairly easy to spot now that we've had a little bit of practice. Of course, the war is justified. Everyone believes it's justified. So if you don't think so, you're not part of the group and you're going to be left out. So this is an example of a bandwagon fallacy. 19 is an example of a red herring. Uh, the issue is too much television being the reason why our students can't read or write. And then we go on to suddenly talk about how excellent the TV shows are. And this is a distraction. This is a different topic. So we've been distracted onto a different topic. 20 should be fairly obvious as an example of an appeal to pity uh, that this particular architect isn't responsible for this building collapse because his personal life is a disaster. Well, it might be true that his personal life is a disaster. That doesn't mean he's not responsible. Those are com two completely different things. So 20 is an example of an appeal to pity. 21 is an example of a red herring. The legislators are asked to advocate and vote for a three strikes and you're out crime control measure. And then we start talking about the personal experience of crime and how terrible it is when it happens to you. Now that may be true, but that's not a reason for advocating or, or supporting a law. And so therefore it's taking us onto a completely different topic. 22 is an appeal to force. You should support this person as the new sales manager because if not, you might get laid off. Well, that's not a logical reason to support the person, but it has psychological force and it will probably work in this case because we don't want to experience the harm opposed by that threat. Okay. Uh, Senator Kennedy, this is 23, Senator Kennedy is opposed to the military spending bill saying that it's too costly. Why does he always want to slash everything to the bone? So here he's uh, opposing a bill and then we're attacking the view that he wants to slash everything to the, to the bone and have a pint sized military, et cetera. So that's a straw man argument. Um, now, 24 is an example of something we just saw. This is too quoquet, right? Dr. Morrison says smoking is bad for you, but he smokes. So he's a hypocrite, therefore we shouldn't believe him. But that doesn't follow at all. It might be the case that he does smoke, but his arguments might be very good that we shouldn't. Maybe he's just a hypocrite. It doesn't mean he's wrong. This is very difficult for most people to keep distinct. And hypocrisy is often, especially in debate, seen as a sign of discrediting an argument. But you know, critical thinkers shouldn't be distracted by these uh, irrelevant issues. Okay, so 25 says uh, Ellen Quinn has argued that logic is not the most important thing in life. Apparently, Ellen is a fan of irrationality. Well, no, she's not. That's a distortion of her view. She's just saying logic isn't the most important thing in life. It doesn't mean it isn't important, and it certainly doesn't mean she's a fan of irrationality. So here we have another example of a straw man argument. 
Antarctica into a world park. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Antarctica is a huge continent teeming with life. It's the home of millions of penguins and seals, etc., etc. All of that might be true, but that's a completely different topic. So 26 commits the fallacy of red herring. 27 says that Naomi Klein has a certain argument in her book, uh, but she's only saying this so that she'll sell more books and therefore her argument has no merit. Here we're trying to undermine her motives or her argument by looking at her motives and saying that they're, they're dubious and therefore her argument is dubious. So this is an argument against the person circumstantial. Notice we're not insulting her per se or her person, but rather her motives. That's what distinguishes the argument against the person abusive, which insults the person, from the circumstantial version, which challenges a person's reasons for making a certain argument. 28 says, Johnny, of course, I deserve to use your bike this afternoon. After all, I'm sure you wouldn't want your mother to find out you ditched school to play Fortnite while she was at work. Yeah, there was a time when people used to play Fortnite all the time. Um, and this is obviously a threat. This is a threat, so it's an appeal to force. 29, we've seen a couple of examples of this. Russell's idea about tax hikes, tax hikes came to him in a dream, so it must be nonsense. So what we're trying to do is to falsify Russell's idea by saying that its origin is dubious. So this is a genetic fallacy. Because the idea came to him in a dream, it's nonsense. Well, that's not necessarily the case. It might have come to him in a dream, and it might be a sound idea. It depends on the idea. 30 says, uh, Jerry says that students who cheat on exams should not automatically be expelled from school, but it's ridiculous to insist that students should never be punished for cheating. Right, it is ridiculous. In fact, Jerry didn't say that. This is a distortion of what Jerry is saying, and so this counts as a straw man fallacy. So these we've all seen before. Hopefully these are becoming simpler for you as we go through them. Let's go on now to the final group, and uh, we'll conclude this brief discussion. So number 31 says, is the Bible divinely inspired? There can be no doubt that it is, for nearly everyone in the Western world has believed this for the past 2,000 years. This is an example of the bandwagon fallacy. It may or it may not be the case that the Bible is divinely inspired, but the fact that lots of people believe this isn't really evidence for that view or against that view. And it's just trying to get us to uh, feel the need to be part of the larger group. So that's an example of the bandwagon fallacy. Whereas 32 is an example of a different indirect appeal to the people. This is snobbery. I'm going to buy a BMW and that way people will see that I have great taste. When we're concerned with how we're perceived in terms of our taste, our sophistication, etc., that's an example of snobbery. Snobbery is different than vanity. Vanity is about our external appearance, our concerns with how we are perceived externally. Snobbery is how we're perceived as internally. Do we have good taste? Are we sophisticated? You can safely ignore Helen's argument for the rights of women because she's a member of the National Organization of Women. Well, that may be true, uh, but really that doesn't matter for uh, her arguments. That's just saying that there are circumstances surrounding her that make her motives questionable. So this would be an example of an argument against the person circumstantial. Um, 34 says a lot of people think that Football jocks are stupid and boorish, but that's a lie. Anyone who had seen that fantastic game our team played on Saturday with three touchdowns would not believe such garbage. Well, the game might have been fantastic, but that has no relevance whatsoever to the claim about football players. It's a red herring. It's a different topic. And the original topic is the players of football, and the argument then goes on to talk about a specific game. They're both about football, so they're kind of connected, but really it's a different topic altogether. And 35 says, it's ridiculous hearing that man from Venezuela complaining about poverty in the United States. Venezuela has twice as much poverty than the United States has ever had. And so what, what this is trying to do is to point out that that person from Venezuela is being hypocritical. And so this is an argument against the person to quoque, where we try to undermine a person's view by pointing out that he's a hypocrite. Now, it might be true that Venezuela does have poverty, and maybe this person is being hypocritical by pointing out that there's poverty in the United States, uh, but that doesn't mean that person's wrong. There is poverty in the United States. So merely because someone is being a hypocrite 
isn't a reason to completely dismiss that person's view. Hopefully you found this review useful and then I shed a little bit more light on various aspects of these questions. I'm, I'm trying to duplicate to the extent that I can the experience of being in a classroom. There are some limitations, but hopefully uh, we have enough resources available that uh, you can learn the material and successfully complete the rest of the class. So uh, you have a lot of uh, material available. There's the textbook. There are exercises in the textbook, and I've posted uh, an answer key for those exercises. There's the uh, original lecture, and then there's this lecture, which, which is a supplement, which is intended to go over the additional exercises in the, in the Fallacies of Relevance folder and shed additional light on those fallacies. Um, I focused specifically on straw man, red herring, and missing the point because those are problem areas. And as I went through the exercises, hopefully I mentioned some other areas that sometimes uh, students initially have trouble distinguishing and have uh, clarified those to the extent that I can. You may still have some questions and uh, your questions are very valuable. And uh, I have posted in the class a question forum. This should be the first thing you see when you log into our class in Cougar Courses. So if, if any of these exercises are unclear or any of the fallacies in general are still unclear, the only way I will know that is if you let me know by posting your questions to the forum and then I'll answer them to the best of my ability. So uh, good luck and I will be uh, recording another set of lectures on the fallacies of weak induction. But since we have spring break coming up and our quiz isn't until after spring break, uh, it'll probably be next week before that's available. All right, so uh, take care of yourselves and I hope all is going well with you and I'll be in touch soon.